Amen, amen. It's something about calling on the name of Jesus. It has a way of changing things in life. I don't know if you tried him, but I have. And I found out when you call on the name of Jesus, things can happen. Amen. 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 First, giving honor to God and his wonderful and glorious presence. And to our presiding elder and his wife, Sister Myrtle Henderson. Amen. It's always a pleasure to have you in worship with us. Amen. Amen. To Reverend Alicia Starnes and to Reverend Taisha Cutherson and to all of the officers and family and friends of these two great churches. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. If you would turn your attention again to the book of 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. I want to lift up the first four verses as our text. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 1. If you have it, say amen. Reading to you from the New Living Translation, it reads, Let love be your highest goal, but you should always desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will, be, will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Amen. I want to share today from the subject of use the gifts that strengthen. Use the gift that strengthens. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment. We ask now, God, that your Holy Spirit would overshadow me. Use me for your will and for your glory. Let your fresh feeling come, O oh God. Let that fresh empowerment come, Father. God, I stand in need of you and only you. So, Father, we ask your blessings upon this moment. And I pray, Father, that you would open our ears and help us to listen. Open our eyes, for we want to see Jesus. Then open our hearts that we might receive him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. Use the gift that strengthens. There are a lot of things in life that can bring us strength. Amen. Uh, some of us, especially the younger generation, uh, they had this saying about certain things where they said, it brought me life. Amen. Unfortunately, sometimes they were talking about the wrong stuff. And they said it brought them life. Woo. Amen. There are things that in this world that will bring life to you, as we say. There are things in this world that will bring strength to you, as we say. Many of us depend on these things called energy drinks to give us a little pick-me-up, amen, to give us a little energy, to give us some so-called life to make it through the day. But how many even know that runs out? You, you might feel it for an hour or so, but then when it comes down, you crash, amen. Then you want to go somewhere and take a nap because that's artificial energy and it ran out. But I've learned in life that sometimes if you want to gain the strength that you need, you need to tap into a power that is ongoing. Tap into a power that never runs out. And I've learned that that power is God Almighty. And I've learned that God can give you the power and the strength that you need so that you never have to worry about being tired in the wrong moment. When you think about God and the power and the strength that he gives, 
And I think about Jesus and the moments of ministry that he's had. And, and it was through those empowering moments that God had given him that he had the strength to minister to the world. Think for a moment as he goes to the cross at Calvary. How does he go to the cross at Calvary unless he has a strength and a power like none other? And it was all because of the strength that God had given him that he was able to go to the cross at Calvary and pay the price. If it had not been for God strengthening him. And again, I always say when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, it was there that he found the strength to do the will of God and not his own desires. We've got to learn to go in the strength of God that we may do the will of God and not our own desires. We've got to learn to walk in the strength of God. But it also happens when we as believers come together and we operate in the gifts that God has given us that we also might find strength. And when we understand that all of the gifts that have been given to the body of Christ are gifts of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the one who gave the gift. And as we saw back in chapter 12 in the very beginning of our series on spiritual gifts, we saw that it was the power who gave the gifts to the believers. It was the power of the Spirit of God who gave each believer the gift that he desired them to have. You didn't pick your gift. God gave you the gift that he wanted you to have. And it's up to us to operate in that gift. And even as I heard somebody say this morning uh, in Sunday school that they're still not sure what their gifting uh, is, we've got to understand that we've got to find out what our gifts are and begin to operate and function in them. And many of you may not have taken the gift assessment yet, but I pray that you would take that so that you would know at least a direction to begin to move in as far as your gifts are concerned. But some of us know what our gifts are. And we know that we should be operating in our gifts. And it's time to begin to operate in the gift. And know that that gift is empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're not the one empowering the gift. You're not the one who decided what gifts you got. It was God who decided what gift you got. And it's God who's empowering the gift that he's given you. It's up to us simply to exercise the gift and to walk in the gift. And as we exercise and walk in the gift that God has given us, we will find out that we'll be a blessing to the body of Christ and a blessing to the world. But I've also found out there is some joy in operating in your gift. Amen. Hallelujah. I always tell people that God messed up when he gave me the gifting that he gave me. And the reason I say that is because it's a gifting I didn't want. Amen. But I had to learn that it was God who gave the gifts. And since it's God who gave the gift, I couldn't pick and choose what gifts I wanted. I simply had to be obedient and operate in the gifts that he gave me. Because if the truth be told, I'd rather be in the background somewhere. If the truth be told, I'd rather be sitting where you are. If the truth be told, I'd rather be serving in the background and, and doing things that happen in the background. But God chose to put me out front with the gift of teaching and with the gift of shepherding. And because he did so, I learned that it wasn't by my own strength and it wasn't by my own power. I've learned that the reason I'm able to do some of the things that I do is simply because it's God who's empowering the gift in me. And once I learned that it was God empowering the gift in me, and once I learned that I just simply needed to get out of the way and let God have his way, get out of the way and let God do what he does best, then I would be better off. And once I learned to get on board with God and learn to go along with him and go along with the ride that he was taking me on, I learned that there was some joy along the way. There were some headaches and there are some hard times of well, but there is joy along the way. What a joy it is knowing that you're in the operation of God. What a joy it is knowing that you're operating under the power and the presence of God. What a joy it is knowing that the Holy Spirit is operating through you, through your gifting. What a joy it is to know that God chose you for the specific gift that he's given you. What a joy to know that that gift can bless somebody's life. All because God chose to give you a gift. But I learned that you have to use the gift that strengthens. And, and what Paul does in this text is he, he begins to deal with uh, the correlation between gifts 
of tongues and prophecy. He begins to contrast how prophecy operates and how prophecy blesses the body of Christ versus how tongues operates and blesses the body of Christ. And of course, you hopefully you remember that I told you there was an issue in the church at Corinth going on with the tongues. And they all wanted to have this special gift of speaking in tongues. And Paul had to let them know, don't get caught up in trying to have the showy gift. Don't get caught up in trying to have the gift of tongues. But you need to have the gift that God has given you. You need to covet and be blessed with the God, the gift that God has given you. And as you operate in the gifting that he's given you, you will be a blessing to the body of Christ. But as I look at our text, I began to see that Paul is trying to get the church at Corinth to understand that they had to appreciate the gift of prophecy. They had to appreciate the gift of prophecy. And I know many of us only associate the gift of prophecy with somebody telling you future events. But the gift of prophecy is more than that. And even when you look at the New Testament, the gift of prophecy is also foretelling the truth. Amen. Telling the truth of God's word. When people come to you and they say, I've got a word for you from the Lord. Many of us enjoy that. Many of us are looking forward to that. Many of us are seeking people out for a word from the Lord. But there are times when people will come to you and just simply tell you the truth of what God is saying. And unfortunately, we have a difficult time accepting that as prophecy, but that's what prophecy is as well. It's somebody telling you the truth of God's word. It's not just telling you your future, but it's telling you the truth of God's word. When somebody comes along and tells us that we're living in sin and that we need to fix it, they're telling us the truth of God's word. It's prophecy, but we don't like that because they're telling us about ourselves. Maybe God sent them to tell you that you got to get it together. The same way he did the children of Israel of old. He would send the prophets out to tell them that they had to get it together. He was sending them to tell the children of Israel that they were sinning against God. And unless they straightened it out, judgment was coming their way. He was giving them the word of truth, but he was also giving them a word to their future as well. So we've got to learn that sometimes God will send someone our way to give us a word of truth to help us and a word of truth that will strengthen us. When we get a true word from the Lord, it has a way of giving you strength. I don't know about you, but there have been times when somebody has told me, now Jones, you know you shouldn't be doing that. And as a result of that, it helped give me some strength that I needed to correct the course that I was on. Because some of us are on a course to sin, and yet we may be enjoying it. But there's someone who will come along and say, you know that's not the course that you need to be on. You know that that's not what God desires from you. You know that's not how God wants you to live. It's time to clean it up. It's time to get it together. You've got a choice to make. Listen to that word that was given to you and correct the things that you need to correct in your life or keep going off course. And I'm here to tell you, if you keep going off course, you're headed for destruction. You're headed for a dangerous place when you keep going off course, when God has sent someone to give you a word that will bless you and to keep you on course. Notice what Paul says in that first verse. He said, let love be your highest goal. Remember I shared last week and the week before I touched on how we need to make sure that we're choosing the right gift to operate in in the right moment. Not every gift is conducive for the situation that you may be in. We have to make sure that the right gift is being exercised and the right gift is being coveted in that particular moment. And Paul had just shared in the end of chapter 12 about love. And he said that love is the more excellent way. And then we saw on last week in the 13th chapter of how love has to be alongside our gifting. And we operate in love and our gifting. They go hand in hand. And now you look at the beginning of the chapter, verse 14. Paul says, let love be your highest goal. Again, whatever we're doing in the body of Christ, we've got to do it with love. Whatever gifting God has given us, we've got to make sure that we operate in that gifting in love. Love is the highest goal. Love was the highest goal when he sent Jesus to the cross. Love was the highest goal than when he came to this earth. Love was the highest goal when they stretched him out. Love was the highest goal when he allowed them to kill him. Love was the highest goal. 
He knew that if mankind did not experience the love of God, that we did not have a chance. So he sent his son Jesus, and Jesus went along with the plan of love and gave his life a ransom for many. He sacrificed his life so that we could have a right to life. And when we understand that love has to be the highest goal. But notice what Paul goes on to say. But you should also desire the special abilities that the Spirit gives you, especially the ability of prophecy. We should desire the special ability, the special gifts that God gives his people, the special gift God gives his believers. If we desire the gifting, maybe that's part of our problem. We're not desiring the gifting of God. We're not desiring to experience the gifting that God is giving to his people. But we've got to learn to desire the gifting that God has given. Do you desire the gift that God has put in you? Amen. Do you desire to be able to operate in that gift? Do you desire to bless the body of Christ with that gift? Do you desire for God to touch you day by day, to strengthen you, to encourage you, to empower you, that you might operate in that gift? Do you desire the gift? If you desire the gift, that means you're looking for those moments for your gift to be executed. You're looking for those moments for your gift to be put into operation. You're looking for those moments where God can empower you and work through you to bless somebody else's life. Those of us who have the gift of giving, God is looking to, through you to bless you that you might be a blessing to other people. He's putting a blessing into your life. He's giving you the gift of giving, the gift to be able to not only make money, but the ability to use that money for the betterment of other people, the betterment of his kingdom. But because we have that gift of giving, the people that have that gift, they get excited when they see opportunities to give. Amen, lights. They get excited when they have that, that opportunity to bless somebody's life. Or maybe you said, well, giving ain't my ability because I'm broke. <laughs> well, maybe mercy is your gift. And you just look for those opportunities. Your heart is so touched when you see situations where people are down. You see people are going through and you have the gift of mercy. And what do you do? Your heart goes out to them. Not just your heart goes out to them, but you have a desire to do something. You have a desire to come alongside them. You have a desire to comfort them. You have a desire to walk with them through their situation. Whatever your gifting is, understand it has been God-given, and you should desire the gifting that he's put in you. But what we usually do is desire the gift that somebody else has. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody else can speak in tongues. I want to speak in tongues. But I hope you paid attention when I read last week that Paul said, not everyone has the gift of tongues. Amen. When we understand that there are some gifts that others may have, but God blessed you with something else. Covet and desire the gift that he's given to you. Desire the gift that he's blessed you with. Because he saw something in you. He saw something to you that he blessed you with that gift. Now many of us don't know why he gave us the gift that he gave us. But he gave it to us nonetheless. Now, my desire is to operate in the gifting that he's given me. My desire is to function the best of my abilities in that gift. But my desire is also to make sure that I lean totally on the power of God. Not in my own strength, not in my own power, but only on the power of God as he blesses me through that gifting. But Paul said, especially the gift of prophecy. Sometimes we get caught up wanting every gift to operate in the church except for the gift of prophecies. Amen. Where God is speaking. Amen. Isn't it amazing that the church can be a place where we want to come and celebrate God, but sometimes we don't want to hear God speak? Amen. We want to hear everybody talk except God. The preacher can preach and he can talk as long as it don't sound like God speaking through him. Amen. I know some of you look at me like I'm tripping. But if you think about what most of the preaching is happening in churches, think about it. What is it talking about? What is it dealing with? When was the last time that you went to church and some preacher preached and said that if you don't get your life together, you're on your way to hell? When was the last time you went to a church and the preacher said, if you don't straighten up, if you don't start following God's way, destruction is headed your way? 
We want to talk about being blessed. We want to talk about having finances. We want to talk about getting all of the materialistic things. But what about just living holy? Amen. What about just living a righteous life? What about just living the life that God has called us to? Amen. Not just going out and being uh, uh, some person in public figure that has everything going for themselves. But what about us understanding and knowing that God has blessed us and he saved us? He saved us and he saved us for a purpose and that purpose is to be a functioning part of the body of Christ where we can bless others and we can reach other lost souls and help them to come in and find the Lord. Amen. What does it say that old saying is I'm just a beggar trying to tell other beggars where bread is. Obviously we want to keep the bread to ourselves. Because we're not telling other people where they can find bread. We're not telling other people where they can find a good God. But notice what he says in verse 2. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God. Since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit. But it will, be, it will all be mysterious. The church at Corinth was coveting the gift of tongues. They were designed the gift of tongues above everything. But Paul says, why do you want that gift so bad? That gift, if you speak in it, it, it you're speaking to God. You're, you're blessing God. You're, 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 you're benefiting yourself by speaking in tongues. Unless there's an interpreter. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to say it while I'm here. If there is the speaking of tongues and there's no interpretation, who gets blessed? Because if you're speaking in tongues, there has to be an interpreter. The reason there needs to be an interpreter so that we know what God is saying. So that we know what the word is coming from the Lord. So Paul says, it's better for you to have the gift of prophecy then to everyone to be speaking in tongues. Remember the chapter back, he said, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. Matter of fact, he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. But I would rather give a word of prophecy because it blesses you. A word of prophecy will give you the strength that you need. A word of prophecy, a true word from the Lord will bless your soul. A true word from the Lord will help your life go better. A true word from the Lord will help encourage you. If you get a true word from the Lord, if somebody speaks in tongues and there is no interpretation, how does it bless you? But Paul says if you get a word of prophecy, a word of truth, it will bless you. If you get a word from the Lord, it will strengthen you. If you get a word from the Lord, it will encourage you. A word of truth that comes from God will bless your soul. Amen. But you've got to understand and un appreciate the gift of prophecy. But not only must you appreciate the gift of prophecy, there was a three-strand purpose of the gift. There's a three-strand purpose of the gift. Look at verse 3. It says, but one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. I like what Paul is saying there because he helps me to understand and to know. There's a purpose in my gifting. And that purpose is to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. And I've shared with you that the gifts are given to us to edify the body, to encourage, and to glorify God. When we look at what Paul says there, but one who prophesies strengthens others. It strengthens you. The word there in that text means to build up, to edify. The word of God is intended to build you it's intended to give strength into your life. When we get a word from the Lord, it builds us up. It lifts us up. That's why when many of us, if we look back to the day that we got saved, it was something probably going on in our life that had us down. But when we went to church, when we went to the house of the Lord, and we heard the preacher preach, and he gave us a true word from the Lord, it had a way of lifting us up. 
And I, I tell you about my own testimony. I was living my own life, doing my own thing, going my own way. And yes, I was enjoying myself. So I thought. But then tragedy hit my life. Not in the form of death, but in the form of a dying relationship. And it seemed like that relationship couldn't get any better, and it wasn't getting any better. And I remember the night that I went to Costco, not Costco, but they have uh, BJ's. And we went into BJ's that early that day, and I had bought a whole bunch of stuff. Amen. I had bought a case of beer. Amen. I had bought like three bottles of, of wine or champagne or whatever it was. And here's the thing. In my down state, I had drank two bottles of the champagne. And I don't know how many of the beers. And I sat there having a pity party for myself. The next morning, I woke up. And the first thing that hit me is you need to go to church. I did not have a hangover. I did not feel bad. I should have, but I didn't. And I called my mom and I said, Mom, I'm going to church with you this morning. What time are you leaving? And her response was, what? I went to her house, rode to church with her. That was the beginning of my journey. I later gave my life to Christ in McClintock Presbyterian Church. But then somebody broke into my car, tried to hotwire, messed up the wiring system. That kept me from being able to go to church, but I could have went. So that's how quickly we can sometimes let the devil in and steal our strength and our joy. I could have called my mama like I did before and said, Mom, I'm going to church with you. But that didn't happen. And then I found myself one day again realizing that I needed the Lord. But a friend had asked me to be in his wedding. And there was another young lady that was in that wedding. Hallelujah. And as I saw her, and as I began to be a part of that wedding, still doing my thing. But as I talked to her, one of the things I remember telling her is that I've got to get back into the church. God had begun to press on my heart that I had to get back into the church. And if I remember correctly, she was telling me the same thing. And it was in that moment that we found ourselves going to revival at East Stonewall Amy Zion Church. And we found ourselves there on a Monday night where the Lord was dealing with me, where the Lord was calling me back to him. And I responded. And I remember on a Friday night, I believe I joined East Stonewall Amy Zion Church. And then from that point on, God kept on dealing with me. The next year, God called me into the ministry. The next year I had gotten married. Amen. And she said, I ain't married no preacher. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. So the Lord was dealing with her and he was dealing with me. <laughs> Amen. But nonetheless, here I stand today. All because in a weak moment, God came and gave me strength. In a weak moment, he came and saved me. In that weak moment, he showed up in my life when I needed him the most. And most of us probably have that same testimony. When you needed him the most, he showed up in your life. When you needed him the most, he came and gave you strength. When you needed him the most, he came and gave you life. When you needed him the most, God showed up for you. But my question is, if he did that for us, why don't we do that for him? When he needs us, where are we? When he needs us to show up on his behalf, where are we? That's one of the things that keeps me going because I remember when he showed up for me. And if he showed up for me like that, and he didn't just show up, but he showed up and gave the best that he had. 
And when I remember that he showed up for me in my moment of weakness, in my moment of downness, why can't I show up for him? That's why I try to show up for him as much as I can because he showed up for me. And he gave me strength. But Paul goes on to say that, and to encourage. Paul is wrapping this three-pronged cord around the believer and letting you know that it's the strength of God, but it's also the encouragement of God. That encouragement, it means to strengthen you as well and to call you alongside of. When you think about that encouragement, to call people to the side of God. That's the preacher's job is to call you to God's side. To let you know that there is a God who is willing to have a relationship with you. As messed up as we are, he wants a relationship with us. And he wants us to come and walk with him. To come alongside him and he can give us all of the strength and encouragement that we need. Life is hard. Life is challenging. That's why you need strength. Life is hard and challenging. That's why you need to be encouraged along the way. And that's why God has given us the Holy Spirit. And that's why he's given every believer a gift from the Holy Spirit. To strengthen and encourage the body of Christ. But he says not only to strengthen and to encourage, but he wraps that third prong around it. The comfort, to give strength and to, to give hope and to, to ease the grief and the pain that we are dealing with, the trouble that we are going through. He gives that to us to bring comfort. And we get this comfort through difficult experiences in life. Many of us in here may know what it's like to have lost a loved one. That comfort that we experience. Many of us know what it's like to have difficulty in life. But it's something about the comfort that God sends. He gives us that peace that passes all understanding. That comfort that God gives us to show up in our moments of weakness and give us strength. To show up in that moment when nobody wants to be on our side and he encourages us. To show up in that moment where we're going through and we just feel as low as we can. He comes along and he comforts us. He wraps that three-pronged cord around us and he gives us all that we need in that moment because of the gifts that he's given to the body of Christ. But he says that word of prophecy can do that for you. That word of truth that comes from God can wrap around you and give you strength. That word of truth that comes from God can wrap around you and encourage you. That word of truth that comes from God can wrap around you and comfort you. Have you ever felt the arms of God just wrap around you? Have you ever felt the power of God just engulf you? Have you ever felt the power of God in your weakest moment come and lift you up? Have you ever felt the power of God just show up and when you're down and out and encourage you and say, you can go on another day? Have you ever felt the power of God? There's a three-strand purpose to the gift. And lastly, there is the desire to strengthen all. Notice what he says in that fourth verse. A person who speaks in tongues strengthens, is strengthened personally. But one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Whatever you're doing with your gift, your goal and your desire should be able to bless the body of Christ. Notice what Paul said. You might have the gift of tongues that affects you personally. But the word of prophecy will strengthen the entire church. Amen. Your goal is to be a blessing to all. That's one of the reasons you got to live in the power of your gifting. So that you are a blessing to all people. Imagine if you walked in your gifting the way God desired you to. You'd be a blessing to everybody. A blessing not only to the body of Christ, but a blessing to the world. Because you're walking in your gifting. That means you're also walking in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers your gift. But if we are not walking in our gifting, if we are not walking in our empowerment, how do we expect to bless the body of Christ? How do we expect to be a blessing to the world if we're not walking in the power that God has given us through the gifting that he's given us? 
I'm so grateful and thankful to the gifting that he's given me. I'm so grateful and thankful that he gives me the power to walk in this gifting. And because he's given me the power to walk in his gifting, why would I dare try to walk in my own power? Why would I dare try to do something that I don't have the power to do? Why would I dare try to do something that I don't have the authority to do? It's only because God has gifted me. It's only because of their gifting and the power that I got the authority to operate in it. When Jesus sent out his disciples and he sent them out two by two, he sent them out with power. Not only power, but he sent them out with authority. The challenge was when they got the big head and tried to do it in their own strength and power. And then they said, Lord, why couldn't we do it? It only is done when you stay connected to him and his power through prayer and fasting. When we understand that we got to stay connected to the power source, we got to stay connected to the one who sends the power. We got to stay connected to the one who provides the source of everything that we do. When we understand that it takes the power of Almighty God, how many of you will go out there and pull your power box out inside of your house and still expect it to be power? None of you, right? So why is it that we pull the plug on God? but still expect to operate in God's power. We don't do the things that keep us connected to his power, but we still expect to have his power. We don't do the things that will promote us walking in his power, but we still expect to walk a powerful life in Christ. How can I ask God to empower me when I haven't been talking to him? How can I ask God to empower me when I haven't been reading his word? How can I ask God to empower me when I'm walking in the flesh every day? Amen, lights. I hear you, lights. We got to learn that if we're going to walk in the power of God, we got to stay connected to him. And staying connected to him means that we walk with him every day. It means we talk to him on a daily basis, not just when we need something. Sometimes the only time we talk to God is when we need something. Lord, you know I need a new car. Lord, you know I need the, the money to pay the rent. Lord, you know I need this. Lord, you know I need that. How about just talking to him? How about just going before him and, and honoring him for who he is? Sometimes you just need to go in his presence and just thank him. Just go into his presence and acknowledge that he is the God of your life. He's the God that saved your soul. Just go into his presence. Lord, I don't want anything. I just want to come into your presence and say thank you. I just want to be in your presence and acknowledge who you are. You've already done so much for me. Lord, I just want to sit and bask in your glory. That's when we understand that we are just seeking the power of God. We've got to learn to seek his face and not just his hand. When we only seek his hand, what about his face? What about the face of God? What about seeking the, the face of God? What about wanting to know God? The same way Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. Moses wasn't asking for stuff. He said, I want to see you, God, for who you are. I want to be in your presence, Lord. We need to learn to do the same thing, to be in the presence of Lord. And Paul, I believe, understood that, what it meant to be in the presence of the Lord. Because he came to a place in his ministry, he said, you know what? I don't care what happens to me now. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've given all that I can give. And then Paul said one time when they were talking about killing, he said, if you do that, I'm okay with that because that means I'll go on to be with the Lord. But you know what? If I stay here, that just means I get more opportunity to minister in his power and in his glory. Paul had learned to be sufficient in everything that God had given him, and he learned to be content. He said, whatever state I'm in, I'm content. Because I know who God is, and I know God is working in my life. When we understand that God is working in our life, when we understand that we know who God is, we understand we know that it's the power of God that operates through me. And when we understand that, and we begin to live according to that understanding, that God is who he is, and I am who I am, and I can't do anything without him. I need the power of the Lord to operate in my life. I need a word from the Lord. I need God to give me a word of truth. And as he gives me that word of truth, it will bring strength into my life. And as he gives me that word of truth, it will encourage me to go on another day. And as he gives me that word of truth, it will encourage me and strengthen me and comfort me through life's journey. I'm so glad that he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. And as we just look to the hill from which cometh our help, because all of our help comes from the Lord. I know who 
the Lord is. Do you know who the Lord is in your life? I know who empowers me day by day. Do you know who empowers you day by day? I know how he's gifted me. Do you know what your gifting is? Are you ready to operate in your gifting? Are you ready to recognize that there are times when God will give you a word of prophecy? He'll give you a word that strengthens you. He'll give you that word to encourage you so that you can go on and do his work out in the world. Are you ready to serve the Lord? Are you ready to give it your all? Are you ready to show that you're a part of the kingdom of God and that you're a part of the body of Christ? Are you ready to use your gift to bless the entire church? Are you ready to use your gift to bless the body of Christ so that the body of Christ might go further, so that the body of Christ might be lifted up? There's somebody who needs to be encouraged. You've got the gift of exhortation. Use your gift. There's somebody who's down and out on their luck. You might need to come alongside them and use the gift of giving. There's somebody who's going through right now. They lost a loved one. Everything is hitting them like a ton of bricks. And you've got the gift of mercy. Can you show up and use your gift of mercy? Is there somebody who has the gift of prophecy? Can show up and give a word of truth? Can show up and give a word to somebody that will bless their life? Do you have the gift that is needed for the moment? If so, use your gift for the entirety of the church. Use your gift to bless the body of Christ. And as we bless the body of Christ, we won't have to worry about some of the stuff that we talked about in Sunday school this morning where people are talking about the church because we're all operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that they can say. There's nothing that they can say when you operate in the power of the Holy Spirit because he won't lead you wrong and he won't have you doing no foolishness if we do what God has called us to do and operate in the power that he's given us through his Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for tuning in today. We pray that this message was a blessing to you. If it was, drop us an email at wesleyonmain at yahoo.com. That's wesleyonmain at yahoo.com to let us know how this message has touched your life. Until next time, God bless.